Section 4, Book the Fourth of the Iliad of Homer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Stephen Carney. The Iliad of Homer by Homer. Translated by Theodore Alois Buckley. Section 4, Book the Fourth. Argument. Paris not being slain, the combat left it doubtful whether Helen should be returned or not. But Juno extorts a promise from Jove of the final destruction of Troy. Minerva then persuades Pandarus to break the truce by aiming an arrow at Menelaus. The wound is, however, cured by Machaon. The Trojans proceed to the battle, while Agamemnon exhorts the chieftains of the Greeks. The fight then commences, Mars and Apollo encouraging the Trojans, Minerva, and the other deities, the Greeks. Now they, the gods, sitting on the golden floor with Jove, were engaged in consultation, and amidst them venerable Hebe poured out the nectar, but they pledged one another with golden cups, looking towards the city of the Trojans. Forthwith the son of Saturn attempted to irritate Juno, speaking with a covert allusion, with reproachful words. Two goddesses indeed are auxiliaries to Menelaus, Argive, Juno, and Minerva of Alalcomene, and yet these, forsooth, sitting apart, amuse themselves with looking on. But to the other, on the contrary, Paris, laughter-loving Venus is ever present, and averts fate from him. But even now has she saved him, thinking that he was about to die. But the victory indeed belongs to Mars' beloved Menelaus. Let us therefore consult how these things shall be, whether we shall again excite the destructive war and dreadful battle din, or promote friendship between both parties. And if, moreover, this shall perchance be grateful and pleasing to all, the city of Priam indeed may be inhabited, but let Menelaus lead back again Argive Helen. Thus he spoke, but Minerva and Juno murmured with closed lips, for they were sitting near and were devising evils for the Trojans. Minerva indeed was silent, nor said anything, indignant with her father Jove, for dreadful rage possessed her, but Juno could not retain her fury in her breast, but addressed him most baleful son of saturn what a sentence hast thou uttered how dost thou wish to render my labour vain and to my sweat fruitless which i have sweated through with toil for the steeds are tired to me assembling the host evils to priam and to his sons do so but all we the other gods do not approve but her cloud compelling jove in great wrath answered strange one how now do Priam and the sons of Priam work so many wrongs against thee, that thou desirest implacably to overturn the well-built city of Ilion? But if thou, entering the gates and the lofty walls, couldst devour alive Priam and the sons of Priam, and the other Trojans, then perhaps thou mightest satiate thy fury. Do as thou wilt, lest this contention be in future a great strife between thee and me. But another thing I tell thee, and do thou lay it up in thy soul whenever haply i anxiously desiring shall wish to destroy some city where men dear to thee are born retard not my rage but suffer me for i have given thee this of free will though with unwilling mind for of those cities of earthly men which are situated under the sun and the starry heaven sacred ilion was most honoured by me in my heart and priam and the people of priam skilled in the ashen spear for there my altars never lacked a due banquet and libation and savour. For this honour were we allotted. Him then, the venerable, full-eyed Juno answered, There are three cities indeed, most dear to me, Argos and Sparta and wide-wayed Mycenae. Destroy these whenever they become hateful to thy soul. In behalf of these I neither stand forth, nor do I grudge them to thee, for even were I to grudge them, and not suffer thee to destroy them, by grudging I avail nothing, since thou art much more powerful, and yet it becomes thee to render my labour not fruitless. For I am a goddess, and thence my race whence thine, and wily Saturn begat me, very venerable on two accounts, both by my parentage, and because I have been called thy spouse. Moreover thou rulest amongst all the immortals. But truly let us make these concessions to each other, i on my part to thee and thou to me and the other immortal gods will follow do thou without delay bid minerva go to the dreadful battle din of the trojans and greeks and contrive that the trojans may first begin to injure the most renowned greeks 
contrary to the leagues. Thus she spoke, nor did the father of gods and men disobey. Instantly he addressed Minerva in winged words, Go very quickly to the army, among the Trojans and Greeks, and contrive that the Trojans may first begin to injure the most renowned Greeks, contrary to the league. Thus having spoken, he urged on Minerva, already inclined. She, hastening, descended the heights of Olympus, such as the star which the son of wily Saturn sends, assigned either to mariners or to a wide host of nations. And from it many sparks are emitted, like unto this, Pallas Minerva hastened to the earth, and leaped into the midst of the army, and astonishment seized the horse-breaking Trojans and the well-grieved Greeks, looking on. And thus would one say, looking at some other near him, Doubtless evil war and dreadful battle din will take place again, or Jove is establishing friendship between both sides, he who has been ordained the arbiter of war amongst men. Thus then did some one of the Greeks and Trojans say, But she, like a hero, entered the host of the Trojans, the brave warrior Leodocus, son of Antenor, seeking godlike Pandarus, if anywhere she might find him. She found the blameless and valiant son of Lycaon standing, and around him the brave ranks of shielded warriors, who had followed him from the streams of Asipus, and, standing near, she thus to him spoke winged words, Wouldst thou now hearken to me in anything, O warlike son of Lycaon? Thou wouldst venture then to aim a swift arrow at Menelaus. Doubtless thou wouldst bear away both thanks and glory from all the Trojans, but of all, chiefly from the prince Alexander, from whom, indeed, first of all thou wouldst receive splendid gifts. If he should see martial Menelaus, the son of Atreus, subdued by this weapon, ascending the sad pile. But come, Aim an arrow at renowned Menelaus, and vow to Lycian-born Apollo, the renowned archer, that thou wilt sacrifice a splendid hecatomb of firstling lambs, having returned home to the city of sacred Zelea. Thus spoke Minerva, and she persuaded his mind for him, unthinking one. Straightway he uncased his well-polished bow, made from the horn of a wild bounding goat, which he indeed surprising once on a time in ambush, as it was coming out of a cavern, struck, aiming at it beneath the breast, but it fell supine on the rock. Its horns had grown sixteen palms from its head, and these the horn-polishing artist, having duly prepared, fitted together, and when he had well smoothed all, added a golden tip, and having bent the bow, he aptly lowered it, having inclined it against the ground, but his excellent companions held their shields before him, lest the martial sons of the Greeks should rise against him, before warlike Menelaus, the chief of the Greeks, was wounded. Then he drew off the cover of his quiver, and took out an arrow, fresh, winged, a cause of gloomy ills. Forthwith he fitted the bitter arrow to the string, and vowed to Lycian-born Apollo, the renowned archer, that he would sacrifice a splendid hecatomb of firstling lambs, having returned home to the city of sacred Zelea. Having seized them, he drew together the notch of the arrow and the ox-hide string. The string, indeed, he brought near to his breast, and the barb to the bow. But after he had bent the great bow into a circle, the bow twanged, the bowstring rang loudly, and the sharp-pointed shaft bounded forth, impatient to wing its flight through the host. Nor did the blessed immortal gods forget thee, O Menelaus, but chiefly the spoil-hunting daughter of Jove, who, standing before thee, averted the deadly weapon. She as much repelled it from thy body as a mother repels a fly from her infant, when it shall have laid itself down in sweet sleep. But she herself guided it to that part where the golden clasps of the girdle bound it, and the double-formed corslet met. The bitter arrow fell on his well-fitted belt, and through the deftly wrought belt was it driven, and it struck in the variegated corslet, and the brazen-plated belt which he wore, the main defense of his body, a guard against weapons which protect him most. Through even this did it pass onwards, and the arrow grazed the surface of the hero's skin, and straightway black gore flowed from the wound, and as when some Maonian or Carian woman tinges ivory with purple color to be a cheek trapping for steeds, in her chamber it lies, and many charioteers desire to bear it, but it lies by as an ornament for the king, 
both as a decoration to the steed and a glory to the rider so menelaus were thy well-proportioned thighs and legs and fair feet below stained with gore then agamemnon the king of men shuddered as he beheld the black gore flowing from the wound and mars beloved menelaus himself shuddered but when he saw the string and the barb still outside his courage was once more collected in his breast but agamemnon deeply sighing and holding menelaus with his hand spoke thus amidst them and all his companions kept groaning with him o oh dear brother now have i ratified a treaty which will prove thy death exposing thee alone to fight with the trojans for the greeks since the trojans have thus wounded thee and trampled on the faithful league but by no means shall the league and the blood of the lambs be in vain and the pure libations and the right hands in which we confided for even although olympian jove has not immediately brought them to pass he will however bring them to pass at last and at a great price have they paid the penalty to wit with their own heads and their wives and children for this i know well in mind and soul a day will be when sacred ilium shall perish and priam and the people of ashen speared priam and when saturnian jove lofty throned dwelling in the ether will himself shake his gloomy aegis over all wrathful on account of this treachery these things indeed shall not be unaccomplished but to me there will be grief on thy account o menelaus if thou shalt die and fulfil the fate of life then indeed branded with shame shall i return to much longed for argos for quickly the greeks will bethink themselves of their fatherland and we shall leave argive helen a boast to priam and to the trojans and the earth will rot thy bones lying in troy near to an unfinished work and thus will some one of the haughty trojans exclaim leaping upon the tune of glorious menelaus would that agamemnon thus wreaked his vengeance against all as even now he has led hither an army of the greeks in vain and has now returned home into his dear native land with empty ships having left behind him brave menelaus thus will some one hereafter say then may the wide earth yawn for me but him fair-haired menelaus accosted cheering him have courage nor in any wise frighten the people of the achaeans the sharp arrow has not stuck in a vital part but before it reached a vital part the variegated belt and the girdle beneath and the plate which brass working men forged warded it off king agamemnon answering him replied would that it were so o beloved menelaus but the physician shall probe the wound and apply remedies which may ease thee of thy acute pains he spoke and thus accosted talthybius the divine herald talthybius summon hither with all speed the hero machaon son of the blameless physician Esculapius, that he may see martial menelaus the chief of the greeks whom some skilful archer of the trojans or of the lycians has wounded with a shaft a glory indeed to him but a grief to us he spoke nor did the herald disobey when he had heard but he proceeded to go through the forces of the brazen mailed greeks looking around for the hero machaon him he saw standing and round him the brave ranks of the shield-bearing hosts who followed him from steed nourishing tricca standing near he spoke winged words come o son of Esculapius, agamemnon king of men calls thee that thou mayest see martial menelaus the son of atreus whom some skilful archer of the trojans or of the lycians has wounded with a dart a glory indeed to him but a grief to us thus he spoke and incited his soul within his breast and they proceeded to go through the host through the wide army of the greeks but when they had now arrived where fair-haired menelaus had been wounded but around him were collected as many as were bravest in a circle while the godlike hero stood in the midst instantly thereupon he extracted the arrow from the well-fitted belt but while it was being extracted the sharp barbs were broken then he loosed the variegated belt and the girdle beneath and the plated belt which brass workers had forged but when he perceived the wound where the bitter shaft had fallen having sucked out the blood he skilfully sprinkled on it soothing remedies which benevolent chiron had formerly given to his father whilst they were thus occupied around warlike menelaus meantime the ranks of the shielded trojans advanced and these again put on their arms and were mindful of battle 
then would you not see divine agamemnon slumbering nor trembling nor refusing to fight but hastening quickly to the glorious fight he left his steeds indeed and his brass variegated chariot and these his servant eurymedon son of ptolemaeus the son of piraeus held apart panting him he strictly enjoined to keep them near him against the time when weariness should seize his limbs commanding over many but he on foot traversed the ranks of the heroes and whichever of the swift-horsed greeks he saw hastening them standing beside he encouraged with words argives remit not of your fierce ardour for father jove will not be an abettor to falsehood but certainly vultures will devour the tender bodies of those very persons who first offered injury contrary to the league and we after we shall have taken the city will carry off in our ships their dear wives and their infant children but whomsoever on the other hand he saw declining hateful battle them he much rebuked with angry words argives ye arrow fighters subjects for disgrace are ye not ashamed why stand ye here astounded like fawns which when they are wearied running through the extensive plain stand and have no strength in their hearts thus do ye stand amazed nor fight do ye await the trojans until they come near where your fair proud galleys are moored on the shore of the hoary sea that ye may know whether the son of saturn will stretch forth his hand over you thus he acting as commander kept going through the ranks of heroes and he came to the cretans going through the throng of men but they were armed around warlike idomeneus idomeneus on his part commanded in the van like a boar in strength but Meriones urged on the hindmost phalanxes for him seeing these agamemnon the king of men rejoiced and instantly accosted idomeneus in bland words o idomeneus i honour thee indeed above the swift-horsed greeks as well in war as in any other work and at the banquet when the nobles of the argives mix in their cups the dark red honourable wine for though the other crested greeks drink by certain measures thy cup always stands full as mine to me that thou mayest drink when thy mind desires it but hasten into war such as formerly thou didst boast to be but him idomeneus the leader of the cretans in turn answered son of atreus a very congenial ally will i be to thee as first i promised and assented but exhort the other crested greeks that we may fight with all haste since the trojans have confounded the league death and griefs shall be theirs hereafter since they first offered injury contrary to the league thus he spoke and the son of atreus passed on joyous at heart and he came to the ajaces going to the troops of the heroes but they were armed and with them followed a cloud of infantry as when a goat herd from a hilltop receives a cloud traversing the deep beneath the northwestern blast and to him standing at a distance it appears while coming over the ocean darker than pitch and brings with it a mighty whirlwind he both shudders on seeing it and drives his flock into a cave such with the ajaces moved into hostile battle the dense dark phalanxes of jove nurtured youths bristling with shields and spears and king agamemnon seeing them rejoiced and accosting them spoke winged words ye ajaces leaders of the brazen mailed argives ye too indeed for it becomes me not i in no respect desire to incite for ye yourselves mightily instigate the people to fight valiantly would that o father jove minerva and apollo such courage were in the breasts of all soon then would the city of king priam bend to its fall taken and destroyed by our hands thus having said he left them there and went to the others there he found nestor the harmonious orator of the pylians marshalling his associates and exhorting them to battle mighty pelagon alastor chromius and prince haemon and bias the shepherd of the people in front indeed he placed the cavalry with their horses and chariots but the foot both numerous and brave in the rear to be the stay of the battle but the cowards he drove into the middle that every man even unwilling might fight from necessity at first indeed he gave orders to the horsemen these he commanded to rein in their horses nor to be confused with the crowd and let no person relying on his skill in horsemanship and on his strength desire alone before the rest to fight with the trojans nor let him retreat for if so ye will be weaker 
and whatever man from his own chariot can reach that of another let him stretch out with his spear for so it is much better for thus the ancients overturned cities and walls keeping this purpose and resolution in their breasts thus the old man long since well skilled in wars exhorted them and king agamemnon rejoiced when he saw him and accosting him spoke winged words o old man would that thy knees could so follow thee and thy strength were firm as is the courage in thy breast but old age common alike to all wearies thee would that some other man had thy age and that thou wert amongst the more youthful him then the gerenian knight nestor answered son of atreus i myself would much wise to be so as when i killed eruthalion but the gods never give all things at the same time to men if i were a young man then now in turn old age invades me yet even so i will be with the horse and will exhort them with counsel and words for this is the office of old men but let the youths who are younger than i am and confide in their strength brandish their spears thus he spoke and the son of atreus passed him by rejoicing at heart next he found the horseman menestheus son of Peteus, standing and around him the athenians skilled in the war shout but crafty ulysses stood near and around him stood the ranks of the cephalenians not feeble for not yet had the troops of these heard the shout since lately the roused phalanxes of the horse subduing trojans and of the greeks moved along but they stood waiting till another division of the greeks coming on should charge the trojans and begin the battle having seen these therefore agamemnon the king of men reproved them and accosting them spoke winged words o son of peteus jove nurtured king and thou accomplished in evil wiles crafty-minded ulysses why trembling do ye refrain from battle and wait for others it became you indeed being amongst the first to stand and meet the ardent battle for ye are the first invited by me to the feast when we greeks prepare a banquet for the chiefs then it is pleasant to you to eat the roasted meats and to quaff cups of sweet wine as long as ye please but now would ye in preference be spectators though ten divisions of the greeks should fight in your presence with the ruthless brass but him sternly regarding crafty ulysses answered thus son of atreus what a word has escaped the barrier of thy teeth how canst thou say that we are remiss in fighting whenever we greeks stir up fierce conflict against the horse-taming trojans thou shalt see if thou desirest and if these things are a care to thee the beloved father of the telmachus mingled with the foremost of the horse-taming trojans but thou sayest these things rashly but him king agamemnon when he perceived that he was angry smiling addressed and he retracted his words noble son of laertes much contriving ulysses i neither chide thee in terms above measured nor exhort thee for i am aware that thy mind and thy breast kins friendly counsels for thou thinkest the same that i do but come we shall settle these disputes at a future time should anything evil have now been uttered but may the gods render all these things vain thus having spoken he left them there and went to others he found a magnanimous diomede son of tydeus standing by his horses and brass mounted chariot near him stood sthenelus son of capaneus and having seen him too king agamemnon reproved him and accosting him thus spoke winged words alas o son of warlike horse-breaking tydeus why dost thou tremble why dost thou explore the intervals of the ranks it was not with tydeus thus customary to tremble but to fight with the enemy far before his dear companions so they have said who beheld him toiling for i never met nor have i beheld him but they say that he excelled all others for certainly with godlike polynices he entered mycenae without warlike array a guest collecting forces they were then preparing an expedition against the sacred walls of thebes and supplicated much that they would give renowned auxiliaries but they the mycenaeans were willing to give them and approved of it as they urged but jove changed their design showing unpropitious omens but after they departed and proceeded on their way they came to rushy grassy Asopus. then the achaeans sent tydeus upon an embassy accordingly he went and found many cadmeans feasting in the palace of brave etiocles then the knight tydeus though being a stranger feared not being alone amongst many cadmeans 
but challenged them to contend in games and easily conquered in all so mighty a second was minerva to him but the cadmians goaders of steeds being enraged leading fifty youths laid a crafty ambuscade for him returning but there were two leaders maon of haemon like unto the immortals and lycophontes persevering in fight the son of autophonus tydeus however brought cruel death upon them he killed them all but sent one only to return home for he dismissed maon obeying the portent of the gods such was the aetolian tydeus but he begat a son inferior to himself in battle but superior in counsel thus he spoke but brave diomede answered nothing reverencing the rebuke of the venerable king but him the son of renowned capaneus answered son of atreus lie not knowing how to tell truth we indeed boast to be far better than our fathers we too have taken the citadel of seven-gated thieves leading fewer troops under the wall sacred to mars confiding in the portents of the gods and in the aid of jove but they perished through their own infatuation wherefore never place my ancestors in the same rank with me him sternly regarding brave diomede accosted thus my friend Sathenelus, sit in silence and obey my words for i blame not agamemnon the shepherd of the people for thus exhorting the well-grieved greeks to fight glory shall attend him if indeed the greeks shall conquer the trojans and take sacred ilium but great grief shall be his on the other hand the greeks being cut off but come now and let us be mindful of impetuous valour he spoke and from his chariot leaped with his arms upon the earth and dreadfully sounded the brass on the breast of the prince as he moved rapidly along then truly would fear have seized even a brave spirit as when on the loud resounding shore a wave of the sea is impelled in continuous succession beneath a northwest wind which has set it in motion at first indeed it raises itself aloft in the deep but then dashed against the land it roars mightily and being swollen it rises high around the projecting points and spits from it the foam of the sea thus then the thick phalanxes of the greeks moved incessantly on to battle each leader commanded his own troops the rest went in silence nor would you have said that so numerous an army followed having the power of speech in their breasts silently reverencing their leaders and around them all their arms of various workmanship shone brightly clad with which they proceeded in order but the trojans as the sheep of a rich man stand countless in the fold whilst they are milked of their white milk continually bleating having heard the voice of their lambs thus was a clamour of the trojans excited through the wide army for there was not the same shout of all nor the same voice but their language was mixed for the men were called from many climes these mars urged on but those blue-eyed minerva and terror and rout and strife insatiably raging the sister and attendant of homicide mars she raises her head small indeed at first but afterwards she has fixed her head in heaven and stalks along the earth then also she going through the crowd increasing the groaning of the men cast into the midst upon them contention alike destruction to all but they when now meeting had reached the same place at once joined their ox-hide shields and their spears and the might of brazen mailed warriors and the bossy shields met one another and much battled in arose there at the same time were heard both the groans and shouts of men slaying and being slain and the earth flowed with blood as when wintry torrents flowing down from the mountains mix in a basin the impetuous water from their great springs in a hollow ravine and the shepherd in the mountains hears the distant roar so arose the shouting and panic of them mixed together antilochus first killed a trojan warrior echiopolis son of thalysius valiant in the van him he first struck on the cone of his horse-plumed helmet and the brazen point fixed itself in his forehead then pierced the bone and darkness veiled his eyes and he fell like a tower in fierce conflict him fallen king elephenor the offspring of chalcodon chief of the magnanimous abantes seized by the feet and was drawing him beyond the reach of darts in haste that with all haste he might despoil him of his armour but that attempt was short for magnanimous agenor having discreed him dragging the body wounded him with a brazen spear in his side which as he stopped appeared from beneath the covert of his shield 
and he relaxed his limbs in death his soul therefore left him but over him arose a fierce conflict of trojans and of greeks but they like wolves rushed on each other and man bore down man then telamonian ajax smote the blooming youth simoesius son of anthemion whom formerly his mother descending from ida brought forth on the banks of simois when to wit she followed her parents to view the flocks wherefore they called him simoesus nor did he repay to his dear parents the price of his early nurture for his life was short he being slain with a spear by magnanimous ajax for him advancing first he ajax struck on the breast near the right pap and the brazen spear passed out through his shoulder on the opposite side he fell on the ground in the dust like a poplar winch has sprung up in the moist grassland of an extensive marsh branches grow smooth yet upon the very top which the chariot maker lops with the shining steel that he might bend it as a fellow for a beauteous chariot drying it lies indeed on the banks of the river so did the high-born ajax spoil simoesius the descendant of anthemion but at him antiphus of the varied corslet the son of priam took aim through the crowd with a sharp spear from whom indeed it erred but he struck leucus the faithful companion of ulysses in the groin as he was drawing the body aside but he fell near it and the body dropped from his hand for him slain ulysses was much enraged in mind and he rushed through the van armed in shining brass and advancing very near he stood and casting his eyes all around him hurled with his glittering spear but the trojans retired in confusion as the hero hurled he did not however hurl the spear in vain but struck emacoon the spurious son of priam who came from abydus from tending the swift mares him ulysses enraged for his companion struck with his spear in the temple and the brazen point penetrated through the other temple and darkness veiled his eyes falling he made a crash and his arms resounded upon him both the foremost bands and illustrious hector fell back the archives shouted aloud and dragged the bodies away then they rushed farther forward and apollo was enraged looking down from pergamus and shouting out exhorted the trojans arouse ye, ye horse-breaking trojans nor yield the battle to the greeks since their flesh is not of stone nor of iron that when they are struck it should withstand the flesh-rending brass neither does achilles the son of fair-haired thetis fight but at the ships he nourishes his vexatious spleen thus spoke the dreadful god from the city but most glorious tritonian pallas the daughter of jove going through the host roused the greeks wherever she saw them relaxing then fate ensnared diorus son of emerinceus for he was struck with a jagged handstone at the ankle on the right leg but pyrus son of embraces who came from aenus the leader of the thracian warriors struck him the reckless stone entirely crushed both tendons and bones supine in the dust he fell stretching forth both hands to his dear companions and breathing forth his soul but pyrus he who struck him ran up and pierced him in the navel with his spear and thereupon all his entrails poured forth upon the ground and darkness veiled his eyes but him aetolian thoas struck rushing on with his spear in the breast over the pap and the brass was fastened in his lungs thoas came near to him and drew the mighty spear out of his breast then he unsheathed his sharp sword and with it smote him in the midst of the belly and took away his life but he did not spoil him of his armor for his companions stood round him the hair tufted thracians holding long spears in their hands who drove him from them though being mighty and valiant and glorious but he retreating was repulsed with force thus these two were stretched in the dust near to each other pyrus indeed the leader of the thracians and diorus the leader of the brazen-mailed epeians and many others also were slain around then no longer could any man having come into the field find fault with the action who even as yet neither wounded from distant blows nor pierced close at hand with a sharp brass might be busied in the midst and whom spear brandishing minerva might lead taking him by the hand and might avert from him the violence of the darts for many of the trojans and of the greeks on that day were stretched prone in the dust beside one another end of book the fourth read by stephen carney